For this month's critical care ultrasound video, we aren't going to discuss a case. Rather, I'm going to explain an echo topic that is very powerful but rarely utilized. It's called the LVOT VTI. So I'll answer the following questions. What is the LVOT VTI and how can it help me with the resuscitation of a critically ill patient? Let's start with the acronym. The LVOT VTI is the Left Ventricular Outflow Tract Velocity Time Integral. It's the longest acronym in all of point of care ultrasound. But to understand the LVOT VTI, you have to understand the stroke volume. And the stroke volume is the amount of blood that exits the LV during each systolic beat. This can be mathematically represented as a column of blood leaving the LV as seen here. If we take that column and look at the components of the stroke volume, you'll notice that there's the LVOT diameter and the LVOT VTI. So the VTI is the length of a hypothetical column of blood, sometimes referred as the stroke distance. Notice that we will assume that the LVOT diameter will stay constant during a patient's hospital course. And although we're not calculating the stroke volume itself, the LVOT VTI is proportional to the stroke volume, which is also proportional to the cardiac output. We actually can measure cardiac output with one more ultrasound measurement, but we won't discuss it today. So how do we get an LVOT VTI? Well, we need an apical five chamber view. So we'll start with an apical four chamber view seen here at the beginning of the video, and then I will tilt the tail of the probe down to display the LVOT, which is seen here as the fifth chamber. We'll activate the pulse wave Doppler. I will place the sample gates in the LVOT right here at the base of the aortic leaflets. Then I'll press the pulse wave Doppler button again to obtain a Doppler tracing. Ideally, your pulse wave Doppler beam should be in a direct line with LVOT blood flow or as close to parallel as possible. Then we will trace around the Doppler wave to get the area under the curve, hence the term integral in the acronym. So how do we trace the LVOT Doppler signal? The old method was to manually trace the border of the Doppler signal as seen in this picture. All ultrasound machines will be able to perform this VTI function. It may take a little practice, but it's not very difficult. However, in the last few years, many of the big POCUS manufacturers have automated VTI software built into the machine. So if available, the software will automatically measure multiple VTIs and average them for you. Some machines will also place the sample gate at the proper LVOT location using artificial intelligence. Check your machine or contact your local sales rep if you're not sure. The normal LVOT VTI measurement is 18 to 22 centimeters. That will be a range that you want to remember. And if your patient is in shock, you can use the LVOT VTI to help differentiate the type of shock. In general, if you have a LVOT VTI that is low or less than 18 centimeters, this is consistent with cardiogenic, obstructive, or hypovolemic shock. If your LVOT VTI is normal to high, which is greater than or equal to 18 centimeters, this is most consistent with early distributed shock, typically sepsis. So why do we even care about this measurement? As I said earlier, the LVOT VTI alone doesn't even give us the stroke volume. Well, the power of the LVOT VTI lies in the ability to trend the measurement. If the LVOT VTI increases by 15% after an intervention, then you've increased the patient's cardiac output and improved their shock state. The interventions could include fluids, diuretics, pressors, changing LVAD settings, positive pressure ventilation, etc. And if you really want to be advanced, then you can pair the LVOT VTI with a passive leg raise. The passive leg raise acts as a reversible and short-lived volume challenge due to the transfer of blood from the legs and pelvis compartments, making it safe in nearly all patients. Therefore, you can perform the passive leg raise instead of an actual IV fluid bolus challenge. So how is this done? We'll have the patient in a semi-recumbent position and measure the baseline LVOT VTI. Then perform the passive leg raise as seen here, wait one minute, and measure a new LVOT VTI. If the patient's LVOT VTI increases by 15%, then they are fluid responsive. Why 15%? Well, there's some variability in the measurements of the LVOT VTIs, whether it's from the probe placement, angle of incination, heart rate, etc. So we do need to make sure that it increases over 15%. Of note, measuring blood pressure change with this method is not very accurate. There have been many methods that have been described to determine if a patient is fluid responsive. Here's a summary figure from a recent study comparing a few of the most common methods to determine fluid responsiveness tested against a gold standard of thermodilution. The serial LVOT VTI measurement seen here in the green line is the most accurate of the methods and it's completely non-invasive as opposed to some of the other measurements. Notice that the CVP is below the reference standard line, so it's worse than a coin flip. 
In addition, all methods have their limitations, but LVOT VTI has the least number of limitations. Your patients can be intubated on any tidal volume and have an arrhythmia. I don't know of any other non-invasive fluid responsive test that is able to work under those conditions. However, there are a few notable limitations to this technique. Most commonly, it will be the inability to obtain an apical five chamber view. If your patient has a dynamic outflow obstruction or severe AR, this will artificially increase your LVOT VTI, and it's unclear if you can still use this technique. And finally, it requires several keystrokes and might be time consuming, so make sure to practice. And if you can't use the LVOT due to one of these limitations, then using the principle of mass conservation, you can measure the VTIs of the right ventricular outflow tract or mitral valve and trended as similar to the LVOT. The concept of mass conservation means that blood flow through each valve must be the same, assuming there's no valvular regurgitation or intracardiac shunting. So to summarize, the LVOT VTI is an echo measurement of the length of a hypothetical column of blood leaving the left ventricle, which represents the stroke volume, and it's a surrogate marker for cardiac output. But the power of the LVOT VTI lies in the ability for serial measurements measuring it before and after a passive leg raise or bolus of fluid to determine if your patient is fluid responsive. If there is a 15% or greater improvement of your LVOT VTI, then your intervention is beneficial for the patient.